Welcome to another episode of Management Muse. I'm your host, Cindy Baldy, and this is my husband and co-host, Jeffrey Tumlin. Yellow. Welcome to the podcast where we try to inspire better work performance. Thanks for listening. Today's session on Management Muse, thank you for joining us. We have the lovely Darren Griffin and Jeff. Take it away. You want to give the All intro? right. Musers, we're talking about nonverbal communication today. You probably know this is body language, but in the old... Which uh, we're going to try to break you of. We're trying to break you of that habit of calling it body language. But it's basically how people communicate through things in addition to their words. And we've got the perfect guy to talk about this. He literally wrote the book on it. Darren Griffin. He's the department chair of the communication department at the University of Alabama. Uh... We knew him years back from uh, at the University of Texas, where he did his master's degree, and He's then he also does deception work with Matt McGlone, who was in last season. Oh yeah, season one. Yeah, yeah. so he has a book on that because you, hey, because one book isn't enough. So he's got a deception book. But today we're going to talk about his nonverbal communication book and all that research. Uh, and he does a lot of work with yep. the deaf community. Yeah. Deaf community, he's done a ton of work, sign language, deaf community, deaf community, a lot of research, and uh, additionally uh, is able to kind of bridge between theory and practice. So he's an expert witness, been in a lot of cool court cases, some murder cases, trained with the FBI in Quantico, and so just a ton of stuff. And so let's get to it. Welcome to the show, Darren. Glad to have you. Uh, start with... If there was only one thing that you wanted to tell our listeners about nonverbal communication, what would that be? Well, first, thanks for having me. Excited yeah, sure. to be here, and this is going to be a fun conversation. Looking forward to seeing seeing where this goes and exploring nonverbal communication a little bit deeper. Um, as with anything, right? Very rich topic, a lot there, but. Uh, I think it's real relatable to everybody because it impacts everyone's life. We're, we're constantly communicating verbally and nonverbally. And so uh, maybe the one of the big things to remember is you really can't untie nonverbal communication from our everyday verbal communication, right? When you're talking and communicating and interacting and building relationships and doing management and leadership, you're always communicating on the nonverbal level. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are less aware of nonverbal. So I guess uh, raising your awareness hmm. about nonverbal communication is probably a big key factor for people is don't miss it and don't um, assume people aren't picking up on the cues and the information that you're telegraphing yourself, right? Just like any communication, it's a two-way uh, transaction and you have encoding and decoding. And what's really neat about nonverbal communication, just like with most things, it's really tied to uh, personal identity culture, different um, factors all play a role in it. So it's a can, lot of fun. Can you do us a favor? Because you're starting to speak, professor speaks. So what's encoding and decoding? Encoding and decoding. So See, that's what happens when yeah. you get really smart people. <laughs> <laughs> encoding and decoding, um, right? The best way to think of that is uh, producing a message and, uh, you know, uh, interpreting a message, right? So when you encode, you're taking what's in your brain and you have some meaning that you want to construe and you put it into some language, verbal, nonverbal, and you telegraph it to another person. Obviously, we're talking about interpersonal communication right now, face to face, right? So in this case, uh, nonverbal happens in social media and all the other channels that we use. But if you just think about it, you, you produce this message and you deliver it to somebody and you use all the different things, right? Timing, um, location, right? When you say it, how you mm -hmm. say it who you say it to, yeah. how loud you say it, how fast you say it. And then that person has to decode it, right? And so you think about it, right? They have to take out their little decoder. They got to interpret it. They got to go, what does this mean? And their perception is going to drive a lot of what they they take it to mean. Their biases, mm. uh, whatever perception mindset they're in, whatever they feel like at the moment, but also your relationship with them. And then the context, right? All that other stuff that's going to drive the interpretation mm. of the message. So... Um, I guess, you know, the best way to think about it, right, if you were talking to a third grader, my wife's a third grade teacher, is when you send a message non-verbally, you send it to someone and they receive it, but it may not be the same message that you intended. So somewhere in there, you got to align 
your perceptions. Do you find that when people know that you're a nonverbal expert that you're kind of scary to them? They're probably a little more scared that I'm a, I have a PhD in deception. My dissertation's on deception <laughs> uh, with, with, with touches yeah. of nonverbal and I study nonverbal. I think, I think uh, the deception you're stuff, shifty. the stuff, the deception <laughs> stuff scares, scares people. They know that I worked with the FBI at Quantico and did FBI training on deception detection and nonverbal communication. Yeah, just to be clear, I'm lying constantly, so just so we're straight. You're so, what? I'm lying. Oh, you're lying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just don't believe constantly. anything yeah, you say, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, the nonverbal thing is, is people will say, I get nervous talking to you because you're reading me. And I said, no, I'm not reading you. Oh, yeah, you are. And, you know, we, we just kind of move on from it. Um, you know, I often get this question, and the question is often, well, how does this affect your uh, your life and yeah. your personal relationships and your with your wife and those kind of things? And uh, generally, you know, I say, well, hopefully it improves it, right? Because I'm using it in a way that's authentic and ethical. And I think that's the important thing for people to think about. If you're going to hone your nonverbal skills, you do it in a way that is is goal driven and mutually ethical between you and your your interactants. You're not doing it just to benefit yourself, right? You want to better understand people, yeah. so you better understand them, and then you can react to them more accurately. But if you're just doing it to increase your sales and you know do things to people that doesn't benefit them in any way, then that's probably bad. And like anything, there'll be a pattern, and people will will catch on to you pretty quickly, and they'll think that you're being manipulative and and persuasive, which you know, char- charisma and persuasion and some of these things, they're sort of closely related, but I think trust is built over time. And so with any tool, any skill, right, a hammer can build a house, but it can also kill somebody. And you you, you use the right tools and you build trust with them and people are going to let you in and they're going to trust you to do the right thing with it. Let's give them a case study. And so Darren was called in as a uh, because he has this expertise in a manufacturing facility where and can I tell him what the setup was sure yeah and so I think it affected a lot of organizations probably yeah, yeah and so it was during COVID and the vaccine had come out and the organization has decided everybody needs to get the vaccine or can't work here anymore and there is you know he's in Alabama as we mentioned and in that part of America there's a non-trivial percentage of people working in this environment that they were vaccine resistant. They didn't feel like inside the organization they had somebody who could convene the hesitant employees and basically say, let's talk through this, let's think about it. But at the end of this conversation, you either have to get a vaccine or you're not going to be able to work here. And so none of these employees know Darren. They've never met him. And now take us through what you did to try to make those eight, he did eight sessions, eight different group sessions with employees in this company. What did you try to do non-verbally to increase the chances that those sessions would be broadly successful in the employees feeling like they weren't blown off This wasn't getting crammed down their throat. They had a chance to have their say. But at the end of the day, it's either either shot or not. Yeah. The the short answer is I created the perception in the interaction with them where they felt heard by me. I was someone who was from the outside that could listen neutrally. And I did it by asking authentic questions that weren't scripted or given to me by the organization – and in asking them, wanted to deeply understand these people. And I listened to them, obviously, what they said, but I also was very aware of where they sat, yeah. what their posture was, the way they said things, who said what, who was the leader in the room. And it didn't take you know, 45 minutes before I could then repeat to them that I understood the issue from their vantage point as a frontline manager and where they were uh, situated in the organization. And then from there could move on to talking about listening and being a leader and trying to empower them to not only do what I was doing with them, but to um, share difficult news with the people that they were leaders for and to be able to have empathy and, and sort of seek a deeper understanding. But one of the things I talked to them about was the nonverbal communication part, mm-hmm. right? When do you ask people? How do you do it? Right. Timing's everything. Um, not just 
listening superficially, right? Listening with your ears and your eyes, right? Yeah. Look at the way the person shows it in their face and their body and their demeanor yeah. and their posture. And so I, I think it was successful in in helping these people understand that someone wanted them to be heard because they brought me in to do it and that I generally cared to understand the problem. Yeah. But then I was trying to give them some communication tools to be a better leader and communicator on the individual level as well. And so what does it look like when <clears throat> somebody doesn't want to listen to you or somebody's not open? Well, in the, the deaf community, it's it's actually uh, pretty interesting, right? Because in, in the hearing community, we, we always hear, right? I mean, yeah. You can't not right. hear. In the deaf community, when deaf people start arguing, the one partner that doesn't want to hear what the other person has to sign just turns and looks the other way and literally right. just won't look at the sign right. language, right? Right. Uh, and that's interesting, right? The way yeah. visual yeah, communication yeah, yeah. is Super different. Um, so I think when we don't, we, we, when we don't want to listen to people, yeah. we we might hear them, but we're looking at something else where our, our attention is occupied elsewhere, right? We all do this, right? We're busy and we multitask, um, right? Going back to me in my own life, I'll start talking to Danielle, my spouse, and she'll be doing something and I'll just stop talking. And then she'll look at me and then I'll try to start again. Then she'll look back to what she's ah. occupied with, and then I'll stop again. Yeah. And my whole thing, because I'm a visual communicator, I can't talk to you unless you're listening to yeah, me. Yeah, and that yeah. means you're looking at me yeah, in yeah. some way, shape or form, right? So when people, uh, when people aren't feeling heard or aren't listening, they show it, right? Their, their, orient, their body orientation is different, like their face, where they're looking, how they're looking. Um, you, you know it when you see it, and I think it goes back to these bids, right? We can't break down nonverbal communication to every single factor and variable because we don't live in a nonverbal vacuum, right? It's not an experiment. We live in this world where if you think of the richness of nonverbal it's just everywhere, all the time, just totally wide open. Yeah. And we got to be able to filter out what's meaningful in that moment and what's not, right? And that's that noise yeah. as communicators, right? Filter the noise out. And there's a lot of nonverbal and visual noise happening at all times as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, uh, very interesting. I mean, it's, it's this layer on top of the words that can mean a lot. Mm -hmm. especially when you're not getting all the words. One of the things when I, I try to talk about sending things in a different channel, right? Yeah. Nonverbal is a channel, right? But when you send a message different ways, uh, one of these funny things, it helps me understand the, the power of a channel, right? The medium is the message. That's the Marshall McLuhanian perspective, right? This is back from the 60s and 70s. But if you go yeah. listen to Marshall McLuhan or read any of his books, you're like, well, this guy had yeah. it figured out. Is if you write someone, I love you, and you put it in a card and you give it to them and depending on where you leave it and what time they receive it, it's going to have one meaning. If you say it to them and you make eye contact with them versus you say it and you roll your eyes, you send it on a social media site or you take it and you put it on a rock and you write, I love you and you throw it through their bedroom window, <laughs> right? You want to send a message, right? Yeah, you right. choose yeah. the timing, the channel and the way you convey it, right? And again, it's intuitive, right? We know how to communicate. We're communicating non-verbally, but it gets a little bit more challenging when you're doing it in the managerial context with a lot of people, with a lot of emotions and a lot of different perspectives. Hello, musers. Now it's time for commercial break. All right, gang. It's time for us to talk about a product that Culture does. That's Cindy's company. It's a, uh, it's a 12 month coaching program where you meet every other month with a coach. All the coaches have PhDs. They know what they're doing. They're really sharp and you get a 360 feedback assessment at the start and at the end. So practically, what does that mean? Six meetings with a coach who knows her or his crap, plus an assessment at the start to figure out how you're actually doing. What, what you want to focus on. Yeah. What you want to work on. And then one at the end to see how you did. People love this program. They've really enjoyed being able to make some quick, they call it quick wins. Easy. Not easy. But but not easy, but Sometimes some there's low-hanging fruit. Yeah. We've been pleasantly surprised there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And so if you're interested in that, culture, C-U-L-S-U-R-E, culture.com. And uh, Cindy and her gang will get you set up. Culture.com, the science behind your people. One of the things I liked about your discussion of the manufacturing facility is that you had each of the groups come in 
and you would position yourself at the classroom with your back to them so that they could see your ponytail. And that was their first impression. Yeah. Why ponytail? What's the nonverbal message that you're sending with, I'm showing you my back and my ponytail? Yeah, I, I generally don't call it a ponytail myself, but yeah, it's, oh. you know, my hair, long hair, whatever it is. You don't call man it a ponytail? Bun. I, you know, <laughs> man bun. <laughs> man bun. Man bun's better than ponytail. Yeah, yeah. Man, man bun's bun. worse than We're, I guess my thing, yeah. right? So, we, need to, we need to address this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we need to figure out what this I is. I think ponytail you know, is an upgrade from man bun, it is, don't you? Totally before, we started, I was, before we started, I was going to say, y'all want hair down or man bun, you know? But we I just like, oh, yeah, you want both. Get a little bit of everything. So... The reason they brought me in on this gig was because I think my blue collar roots, right? That I had worked in blue collar jobs in manufacturing. My family has been in manufacturing. Um, I've worked in manufacturing facilities. And so as they brought me in, okay, what's the problem? What are we doing? And I did like the, the client audience this analysis and I'm, I'm figuring out the flavor. And I'm like, man, this is, sounds like a very volatile situation, right? Because this could go anywhere. Um, I said, what room are we going to be in? What's it going to look like? Give me, you know, let's talk about the space. Well, we're stuck in this one room. Well, that ain't good. You know, we, we, yeah. we in a perfect world, we could be able to move people around, have tables set up so people could collaborate, how we want to do it. Okay, we got this conference room. Okay, good. Where's the door? I mean, I had these people draw it out for me and they're looking at me like, what does this matter? And I said, yeah. look, when they walk in the room, the last thing I want to do is I don't want to be the first thing they see and I'm look, I'm you know 180 degrees yeah. facing them, and I'm their adversary, some unknown guy. And of course, we have to remember at the time, big handlebar mustache, yeah, ponytail nice. as you call it, and you know dressed the part right. I wasn't wearing a full blown suit, right, creating yeah. uncertainty, right. I, was, I, I looked like what or they formality. would expect, right. Yeah, I, I was looking like what they expected. But I I sat in and I sat at the first chair when you walked in the room to the left, and my back was facing the door. Every single person that came in that room looked at the back of my head. Okay, this guy's got a ponytail. This guy, then they, I turn and look at him, and then we start having casual conversations, right? And they and see the handlebar mustache. They see the handlebar mustache, and I build rapport with them, and I make eye contact with them, and I use all these things, the bids, right? Look mm -hmm. at them, acknowledge them, make small yeah. talk, say something about what they're wearing, how long you worked here, something just totally minuscule. And, and then build up the flavor. And then, of course, when we got formal and started the meeting, I had someone else introduce me and talk about some of the things that I had done that made me relatable to these people because yeah. I think you got to be relatable. And do they need more of the relatable piece of this guy has a blue-collar background? Or did they need more of the credibility of why are we listening to this idiot? Yeah. Or how did that? I think they need both, and I think that's what we got to remember about nonverbal. We can't do nonverbal without verbal. They are always hand in hand. So, okay. right, we, right, we need both. Um, I'm going to transition to when I do police training. All right. So I've done a lot of police training. Uh, Jacksonville State University does a lot of police training. Police in officers. Pl uh, that's actually in Alabama. Okay. North right, Alabama. Right. And, and police officers have to do continued education units or CEUs yeah, yeah, yeah. hours. And they'll do an eight-hour day, and I'll go in there, and I'll do training on culture, interpersonal communication, nonverbal deception, whatever the cops are interested in. And, you know, police officers, right, they don't know who I am. Right. I'm a professor, right? They're cops, right? right. There's, a dis there's a disconnect there inherently. And I think that one of the things that police officers are good at, I, I would like to think most of them are master noticers because their life depend on it. Mm -hmm. They're on the nonverbal level. Um, they come in the room and they look at my demeanor. They're looking, they're going to listen to what I say about my credibility. I got a PhD and I study these things, but they're also going to look at the way that I'm conveying it nonverbally, mm -hmm. right? The way I stand, dress yeah. and engage with them. And the thing that I learned from them in, in doing this is this idea of command presence, and obviously, I don't think we should talk to managers about having a command presence, but there's probably times where you do need a command presence. Is the, the police officers described it as when they interact with a citizen who's a threat, mm -hmm. they have to communicate instantly on the nonverbal level that I'm not dying today. Right. And that's exactly how the officer explained it to me. I got to get out of the car and I got to show nonverbally that I'm not dying today. You're not going to kill me. Right. Well, when we talk about organizations, thankfully, we're not in organizations where we're all trying to kill each other, but people do have conflict and they're trying to interact with each other in this way. And I think managers got to have this command presence, but they got to have a scale that's very sensitive and yeah. they can't tip the scale. Right. They can't use power dominance to just overpower people nonverbally. And when you have true power, like a, a manager or someone who's a leader, it's easy to enact it nonverbally. And they call those dominance behaviors. 
And if you if you utilize those dominance behaviors in the wrong way, then you again lose trust and respect, and people only follow you because you have power to punish them. Right. And I think we don't want to do that. Nonverbally, we want to empower our followers as leaders and managers. We want to empower them intrinsically, and we want to know we want to use nonverbal so that they know we're authentic and what we're saying is is true and meaningful because it matches with what we're behaving what we're showing well yeah i can see how uh if you were exhibiting like the command behaviors like that's basically telling people don't don't come to me and talk Mm -hmm. don't don't bring me your controversial opinions don't give me your problems like i'm not really listening yeah yeah i think that's a good point it it reminds me of something that we thought about as we were preparing for our discussion today is this idea of in the managerial world that we're interested in on this podcast, there's an inherent power differential is that we're talking mostly to managers who manage other people. Mm -hmm. And how does that impact, if it does, what people can get away with in their nonverbal communication? You mean the managers or the employees? I mean, both. What's the what's the relationship between like, for example, uh, you know, if I have more power than you, I think it's been a long time since I've been into this research. But typically the people who have more power in a relationship tend to cuss more, tend to speak louder, are able to uh, shorten turns in conversations are able to interrupt more often, things like that. And so I'm wondering what what should our managers know about how the differential between formal and informal power, between manager and direct report, how that influences or can influence how we relate to each other in the conversations? The... The thing, you know, I think this is a pretty big question, but the thing that I'm thinking about is be broaden your your spectrum of your ability to navigate power and dominance and verbal and nonverbal and understanding the relationships, right? Professional, personal. Um, You have the task oriented communication and the relational building communication, right? So if you think about these are all dimensions now I'm becoming a professor, right? And you have all these dimensions of what's happening. And, and being able to sort of analyze, right, that globe of what's happening at any point and being able to know where you are. Yeah, yeah. Right? Know sure. where you are. Know what the goal is. Know what the power dimension is. Know when to play it, when not to play it. And I think people who fail are people who have one persona, right? They always hit yeah. the nail with yeah, the hammer, yeah. right? It's Every problem point. the same way, right? Is, is yeah. their leader – you know, and actually I was at a restaurant – on Friday night in Tuscaloosa. I don't feel bad talking about it very specifically. I won't say the name of the restaurant, but I was watching the manager and you knew he was the manager. He didn't have manager on his shirt. Mm -hmm. I knew he was the manager because the way he was treating people and the way he was walking around, no one else was walking like him. He had this sort of prance and this swagger and he was touching other people. And of course he was a white man and there's a lot of women working in there and he's touching them and just totally had like the creep vibes in my mind. Like, I had no respect for this guy. I was looking at him. I'm going, he's got it all wrong, right? And what's happened is he sort of slipped into this persona of he has the power. He gets to make the calls. He tells people what to do, but he's walking around and showcasing it. Mm -hmm. I'm a stranger and I know who this guy is. The best manager would be the manager that you didn't know they were the manager. You thought that they were a waitstaff because they were acting like everyone else. And when something happens and they need a leader, that's when they enact their nonverbal presence. That's when they take command of the situation with their dominance behaviors or their power plays or whatever it is, whether it's verbal or nonverbal. But to just walk around with that presence, um, I guess you could think of that in the nonverbal world as an affectation, right? He was communicating who he was, and I didn't even need it. I didn't really need to know, right? So it kind of turned me off, right? Who knows yeah. why, right? But why do I even care? But I'm just watching them, like, who are these people, right? What's going on here? And so I don't think you want to be that kind of manager. Mm-hmm. I don't think you want to be the manager. I think that when you meet somebody, they don't necessarily know who you are until you tell them who you are, you tell them what you know, or until it becomes relevant. Uh-huh. And and so, right, this this manager that I'm talking about, maybe it works in the world that he's in. With these younger women who are Right, that he servers. has to kind of assert this and be this way, and he has to be, you know, he has to have this kind of cocky 
uh, affectation to him or demeanor to him, but it, it didn't work with me. Right. But I'm just one person. Right. And so I think that's another important point that we ought to talk about just briefly, if nothing else, is there's a lot of individual difference sure. in the way people communicate nonverbally uh, when it comes to eye contact, facial expressions, body orientation, deme- you know, posture. People carry themselves differently and they communicate differently. And part of it is their personality. And part of it might be their socialization. Part of it might be their culture. Could be um, could be their gender, yeah. sexuality, um, could be a disability. Right. And so we're in a world now where we're learning all about these identities. And, and so we have to also be conscious that that nonverbal is tied to some of these things. And those things are sort of driving the nonverbal uh, message that people are sending out and how they receive your yeah. nonverbal. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's I'm glad you made that point. It's kind of an overarching theme of our podcast is I wish we could say it differently, but we're really concerned about management and in most of our conversations, we come back to things are very complicated, and that's the bad news. And we have to try to pay attention to the complexity. But the good news is you don't have to be perfect. We're not asking anybody listening to this podcast to try to be as in tune to nonverbal communication and cues as Darren is, because that's that's not the goal. The goal is to tomorrow to be a little more attentive than we are today, and then the day after that, to be a little more attentive, but you're never going to be perfect and you're going to make, you're going to misread things and going to make errors uh, frequently, but that's okay. That's part of the normal uh, friction, the cost, if you like to use that term of being, being human. But I think it, I think there's also another point that's in there and it's that because we do have individual differences that you have to be adaptable Mm -hmm. and that when, when your message fails with the way that you've delivered it, you may, if you have the opportunity, pick up and try to deliver it a different way because that it wasn't received by that person in that moment. And so you have to try to figure out how to adjust. And as a manager, seek feedback because how are you going to know how people interpreted your nonverbal and your verbal message? You're going to have to ask them in a way, that, that allows them to tell you in a non-face threatening way. And so, you know, I was talking to y'all about this uh, last night at dinner about perception checks, mm-hmm. right? Is find a way to do a perception check because what you thought you saw and felt and heard may not be what was intended, right? We know that miscommunication happens. Find a way that's sort of natural and organic to have these perception checks with people who you trust and they trust you, right? So you might have Uh, In my case, I might have 22 faculty, right? I'm not going to do a perception check with every single one of them, but I'm going to have some trusted folks that understand my true intentions and my goals and who I know their true intention goals. And we have rapport and I'm going to do a perception check uh, sometimes before I do something, right? Right. How do I deliver this message? When, where, how? Help you Um, plan. And then the other one is to check back in with them and go, how do you think that went? Because they're talking. Everyone's talking in organization, right? And they're not always talking up to leadership and to management, Sometimes it's it's going around in circles or going sideways. And so find a way to sort of uh, find the liaisons in the organization. Yeah, I think that's a good point. We we have a CEO who we like very much. Uh, but she, I think, leans on feeling like if she has the conversation, then it's it's sort of the fault is on their end if they haven't communicated the message. And there have been many times where I've, I've been like, you know, that's hard for somebody to do with their boss. And so I like the, the suggestion that it's, you know, getting the perception check, not necessarily from that person directly, mm-hmm. but from the observers. Yeah. Other people, third party perception checks. Um, a little adage, I guess I use sometimes that I think helps people is information is not communication. And in organizations, a lot of times they want to put stuff in writing and convey it to people, send it an email, right? Whatever different yeah. modalities they use. And they share this information as though it's going to cause some change or it's going to communicate something. And I think it's important when you think about nonverbal, right, is nonverbal, again, it's not it's not body language, right? It's a different type of information, highly ambiguous, very rich total up to interpretation based on time, space, relationship and all that. And so conveying information and adding nonverbal at the individual level based on all that nuance and that granularity that we understand as managers helps us breach that 
that goal, right? Helps us read the, the intent and the message that we're trying to look for. And so let's get to a very pressing question. Oh, can't wait to hear this one. I'm sure it's going to be ridiculous. <laughs> How does a, what is your choice as a nonverbal expert when you choose handlebar mustache and ponytail? I think the hair and the mustache are conveying two different pieces of your identity that you want communicated for people to relax around you or whatever. The mustache is not a typical mass mustache. It's like an old fashioned wonky <laughs> like one the with baron. the wings. Like, like the like red the wings. Yeah, yes. like old western. Yes, it's fantastic. I, I'm not even really a fan of facial hair, but yeah. you and John um, Bannis, you guys can pull off facial hair and I applaud you and you should go into like that mustache cost that contest. Yeah, on your, on your website for the, the the podcast, you got to have the image of me with the mustache. Yeah, we'll put right your Actually, yeah. oh, shoot, I should have yeah. brought the fake mustaches that oh my God. we had. Because yeah. yeah. we could all take a picture with a mustache. There go. Yeah, we'll, we will make a picture of his handlebar mustache yeah. widely available. Yeah, and it is. It's a fantastic I'll mustache. send you one a couple months ago. It got so long that it was like tickling my cheeks, and I had to trim it because it was just getting... Just, That's uh, perfect. That's yeah, exactly totally what we want. Yeah. Oh, and awesome. so I think for that, like it's like trying to convey that, yeah, you're an academic but you have this 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 personality yeah. that you know you're you're willing to have fun and uh, maybe even just even a little bit of distinctiveness in there because it's a distinctive mustache and then the hair i think is that you feel like you are and want to convey an easygoingness and long hair is kind of hippie and roll with it and not that you're trying to be a hippie, but like that, that easy going, I'm going to go with the situation. The mustache I've been wearing and, and when I realized I could grow it during my master's program because I was out in Dripping Springs working as a ranch manager in the summer because they didn't fund me at the University of Texas at Austin, the in second best. No, uh, master's? Yeah, my master's. And I look in the mirror one day and I'm like, whoa, I can grow a mustache. And, and so the, the handlebar mustache sort of came to life. Um, the, the hair, I think, was sort of an artifact of just life events, you know, uh, losing a f- close family member, COVID, tenure experience. You have no control over those things, right? And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, I'm a disruptor, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's why, in some ways, in my opinion, I'm a department chair and an interim department chair is because, like, let's, we have a transition. Let's put a disruptor in here, right? Let's see. This is like a bad joke. But I'm sort of a disruptor in my teaching style and, right, the way that I sort of live my life. Um, and I think the hair sort of kind of goes against the grain because like you wouldn't know how many people have like made comments about me cutting my hair or they, they, they have a feeling about my hair and they want to sort of impart it on me. Right. And so like, obviously if you think about the journey I'm on in my professional growth, the hair doesn't fit that right. Right. If you're going to be an administrator, you, you know, you're, you're clean cut. When I think about who I am, I don't think of myself with this hair, right. Because I've had short hair my, most of my whole life. But the other day when I cut my mustache, people were visibly upset about it. They were like actually disappointed that I shaved my mustache when I came to campus. And what the hell? And they wanted an explanation. Why? And the only thing I can come up with, and again, it's maybe it's sort of sub-psychological or something, is the, the mustache and the hair are two things I can control. And I know that they communicate a message to people. And I know people feel a way about me when I have a mustache or hair. But right, I'm more than my hair and more than a mustache. And I have faith in the fact that like I am who I am and we all are right we all have our own personal identities and we our feelings and and a lot of that's tied into the way people treat us based on how we act and how we look and how we present ourselves right so it becomes this sort of vicious cycle so I'm taking something that was sort of fun and lighthearted and making it a little bit too serious but mm. um the, well I mean the, I kind of was on it with the mustache I got yeah. a little bit on it because I said yeah, that yeah. it was to, to sort of differentiate you from like sort of the stereotype yeah. professor. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, just the, the, the mustache is just like, oh, you know, people have their look and their facial hair and all that. And I, I can't grow a beard. You know, I'd probably have like a ZZ top beard if I could, right? Like what's my spirit facial hair? It's like yeah, the yeah. big ZZ top beard, just be that guy. Um, but I can't, I, don't, I can't grow any of that. But the hair at this point, I kind of like COVID and all that stuff made it possible. And then I'm like, you know, I like went to Italy for a month. I wasn't going to get a haircut in Italy, language barrier, all this stuff is happening. Finally, oh, I'm just going to grow it out. And at this point, I just sort of like creating these like false goals. And I'm like, I'm either going to grow it to my belt or until I become full professor, one or the other. Mm. Hmm. Which one's going to happen first? That's the question. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> 
I'm not sure. I'll have to I'll have to take it down at the end and so you can see how long it is and then you can sort of like figure out how fast is his hair going to grow. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll give it the yeah. we'll give it the full assessment. Hello, musers. Now it's time for commercial break. People know they need something but they don't know what to call it. And so a lot of times it's when you want to get a group of people together and it could be that you have a important issue, but you haven't been able to tackle it in a way that brings out the best ideas. It could be that you have just a lot that you need to get through and it's hard to be part of the conversation and manage the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's something that's gotten a little off track and you want to do a reset, but you, all the people who you need in the room are involved in the issue. And so there's not a natural person inside who can kind of help lead that discussion. It could be that maybe some of the topics have been off limits for a while and yeah. you need some help bringing uh, them back into onto the table. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're increasingly doing more and more of these kind of conversations uh, through our leader development company, On Demand Leadership. And so if there's a conversation that you need to have but it's been tricky, consider giving us a call. We're able to help you convene the right people, frame the problem in a way where you're likely to be able to make progress. OnDemandLeadership.com, OnDemandLeadership.com. You're looking for our facilitation package. You were going to give bad nonverbal advice, terrible or, or, advice. Or what's the bad advice that? Oh, that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. What's bad conventional wisdom? Yeah. That any that any nonverbal behavior means something, right? right. That, that that even a frown doesn't always mean I'm upset. It could mean that I don't know. Yeah. Um, potentially, I'm feeling a certain way. Self adapters, right? There's all these different things going on. So bad advice is that when, oh, when that people something are doing this, means something. yeah, they're doing this or lying. Yeah. When they're doing this, they're thinking a certain way, right? There was this thing called neuro-linguistic programming that was like, oh, when people are looking up to the left, they're being creative. And so then they're, therefore they're lying. And I'm I'm going, you know, just the logical principle of that. There's right. no research that supports yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. but when people are telling the truth, they're being really creative yeah, because yeah. they're telling a version of the truth, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. that's an important thing to remember too, is that people, hmm. uh, they act and behave and they say things but it's always a choice out of an infinite number of things they could have said and they could have shown non-verbally. And ultimately, if you know the person, you trust them, and you know their motives, they're generally probably good and they're probably trying to tell the truth, but they're telling, now I'm getting to deception stuff. They're telling the least damning version of the truth, yeah. right? And there's probably some politician that said that in front of Congress at some point, right? I told the least damning version of the truth. But yeah, don't don't try to interpret nonverbal behavior as an absolute. Be tentative. That was one of the things that I learned when I was yeah, studying. Yeah, it's actually non-verbal. not a language. So like, th- just because somebody goes, does this, it doesn't actually mm-hmm. mean in the book. Um, yeah, I'm defensive. Uh, a story that I learned from one of my mentors in academia, who was a nonverbal scholar early in his career, and he still you know does it. Once a nonverbal scholar, always a nonverbal scholar. <laughs> he was in sales when he was younger. And I don't know where he learned this because he was probably studying nonverbal that he was selling homes to people. And when he would uh, walk into a house with somebody and he was trying to sell them different houses, he would go in front of them into a room and enter the room first instead of in, behind them, like what you traditionally do. You let the, the customer go in first, just politeness. He would get a leg up and get out in front of them and he'd turn around and he would look and he would see where they looked. Mm. And when they looked at something, that's what he talked about. Instead mm. of what he thought they wanted to hear, mm. right? Sell in the kitchen. No, oh, that is interesting. Yeah. If they look at the cabinets, yeah. talk yeah. about the cabinets. Yeah, yeah. If they look at the sink, you talk about the sink. Yeah, we can change that. Yeah. You like that sink? Right, ask the questions. Mm. And it's a very specific story and it's sort of cool for sales, mm. but I think it actually is a good story to remind us about yeah, yeah, people. Yeah. Non-verbally, people direct their communication in the area of their interest. They're either going to look at it with their eyes. They're going to orient their body. They're going to do something to communicate their interests and their goals, right? So if you're really paying attention to people in a situation, 
based on the way they act non-verbally, you're going to know what they care about. And then it's going to help you ask the right questions or talk about the right things. But that's a whole nother level of consciousness that that's, I mean, you're going to have to, yeah. you're going to have to practice for a while before you can get to that naturally. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there's, you know, there's this whole layer of amateur communication, which is what do you want to accomplish and what's the best way. But at the pro layer, they're, know what they want to accomplish or would like to accomplish, but they're letting it happen. They're letting, they're not forcing stuff. And instead of, okay, I want you to buy this house and here's my main points for why this would be a good house. And here's the thing on the price. And here's the thing based on the number of kids you say you're going to have and the number of kids you already have. Instead of doing all that and getting all ginned up with the evidence, you're, going to spend an hour with them walking through the house and tr and trust that if you're paying attention, if you're being observant, and if, in fact, this is a fit, you're going to be able to find the organic ways in the conversation to much more powerfully cement their decision. And... And we talk about that a lot because letting things unfold is harder to do because you're giving up a lot of the control. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, we're finding in the work that we do in organizations that we're following where their eyes are going to the cabinets metaphorically mm. or to the windows instead of being the people talking about cabinets and windows, yep. even though we know a lot about cabinets yeah. and windows. It's that needs-based approach, right? Mm -hmm. Is you let the client um, lead you. Sometimes they don't even know what they need, right? They don't even know they like cabinets. Their eyes just get drawn to them. But um, I think that's important, but I think it's important for managers, right? Same yeah. thing, right? Well, you're doing it in your organization because of the communication skills you have. Uh, managers, right? Follow the information, follow the, the nonverbal breadcrumbs. They're going to lead you to what people are feeling and thinking. And, you know, what people say is important, but it's probably... But it, it's impression management. Right? Yeah. Like you're not usually just saying something without having some sort of goal or yeah. motive yeah. behind yeah. it. Anything else that you want to share with our managers before we integrate everything? And then we'll give you last words. Looking for that golden nugget, huh? Well, I'm going to integrate a few. <clears throat> and so I think some of the key things that come out of this podcast uh, are if we only have one recommendation, it's to be a super noticer. Pay attention. You don't have to always know what people are thinking or feeling, but if you're paying attention, it increases the chances that you're going to have a better, more comprehensive read on the environment that you're in. It won't be perfect, but it'll be better. Two, don't feel like raised eyebrows always mean I'm about to get mad. Because sometimes raised eyebrows means I'm unsure. Sometimes it means I'm about to scratch an itch. It could be yeah. anything. So one thing is not a telltale signal. Uh, and then if I can add the third thing, it's to don't try to be right. Try to be the best version of yourself in that conversation that you can be. And then see what happens. Yeah. The situations that mercifully most people in most situations are forgiving. And we are able to take all this junk in our head, all these agendas that we have, stuff to do, we're busy, a million things going on, a million things we're thinking about, and we actually function pretty well together. It's not perfect. And we've got stuff we're trying to smooth out in companies and more broadly in our society. Well, but, yeah, and yeah. perfection is, you know, if people are involved, perfection is not actually attainable. So we're just, we're striving for excellence. We're not striving for perfection as yeah. Adam Grant. Yeah. Has said. And yeah. and as Cindy and Jeff are saying, be be willing to be wrong. Be comfortable 
in that space, but do it when it's appropriate. Mm-hmm. There's things that you can't be wrong about in certain organizations, right? I mean, y'all do healthcare stuff. There's going to be times where you can't be wrong. And, and if you, if you do, then it's, it's damning. And, uh, but there's times when you're dealing with people, nonverbal communication, trying to get the message, trying to build the relationships and stuff. And it's okay to be wrong. And by acknowledging that you might've been wrong or misunderstood, or that you could have been the source of a miscommunication that you're going to actually do, uh, do more positive by building trust and rapport. People, right. will like you more. They'll think you're human. Um, I, we've probably all had a manager or leader who could never be wrong and they're just annoying as shit. Mm. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to add, Doug? Uh, I, well, one of the things that was going through my head when you were talking was, you know, we, we have this rule in society, you know, the golden rule, do unto mm. others. And that assumes that we're all very similar. And there are similarities, but we're also very different. And I think about, uh, I just did a, a, a class for a, a few people in an organization about communication. And there, a few of them were like, well, I hate being touched when I'm crying. So I just walk out of the room when other people are crying. And I'm like, maybe just read the cues because some people they you know it's okay to just not have anything to say and be and hang in the moment but some people are going to want company and some people are going to want comforting and just because you don't want it that that may not be a good guide Mm -hmm. and so I, i think countering Sure, like, you know, don't be horrible to people because you wouldn't like that. So I get the gist of why we have the rule. Yeah. But I think you have to be more nuanced than that by listening to what people are actually saying to you that they need and and then also paying attention to the nonverbals. What's the, the golden rule? How's the, the catchphrase do unto others is that you'd have done unto you. Yeah. I've heard someone say the platinum rule do unto others as they want done unto themselves. Mm. which would require being a better communicator because you have to know what they're saying, what they want. Um, That's an important point. Uh, All right. We're going to send them out. Thanks to Darren Griffin for coming and dropping some wisdom on us about nonverbal communication. Lots to take in, but really appreciate your way of putting everything together for us. Got any famous last words? Thanks for having us and uh, see you on the next one. Yep. All right. Thanks, Darren. Thank you, Dale. Thanks again for joining us on The Management Muse. We appreciate likes, stars, downloads, shares, and subscriptions. For more information on the resources that help us generate this content, check out the reference material in our show notes. Special thanks to Rebecca Henley, Abby Ariano, and Ariel Villafane. Thank you. See you next time.